Morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for about the next, eh, almost half hour, I'm gonna be your ranter and raconteur. I'm gonna be talking about things important to me and that I think are worthy of your attention. If at any point you have any questions, comments, whatever about the show, you should send them to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and you can comment there or you can get the email address from there and send me an email. Uh, please, if you do send me email, uh, be a little patient about an answer. I um, can be a little slow about answering my mail, but I do answer it. And be sure to include something in the subject line like left side of the aisle, your cable show, or something obvious so that I know it's not spam. All right, with those by now standard introductions, let's get to it. First thing this week, we're going to jump right into the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to well-known sci-fi author Orson Scott Card. Now, the funny thing, you know, years ago, I used to read uh, Card, uh, read his columns of game reviews in computer magazines, because even if I wasn't interested in the game, which was true the vast majority of the time, um, I, I found his comments on computers and on the computer industry interesting. Well, I can only assume that in the years since he's been the victim of some alien brain-eating parasite of a type that uh, he might have featured in a story. Just last year, Carr declared that same-sex marriage is not about rights, it's about quoting, giving the left the power to force anti-religious values on our children. He also said that there are no laws discriminating against homosexuals and that homosexuals can change to heterosexuals anytime they want, perhaps through some of the gay conversion therapy which New Jersey has just happily outlawed. Well, it turns out now that Card is as much of a racist as he is a homophobe, as well as deeply, deeply paranoid. In a recent column on a site called the Ornery American, which is part of, it declares, part of the OSC network, which actually just proves to be five different sites that Card uh, oversees, <laughs> grandiose much, Orson? Um, anyway, uh, he describes in, in his column on this website, he describes his scenario of how Barack Obama becomes dictator for life. Obama, he has already described in this as the dumbest president in American history compared to Hitler, but despite being the dumbest president in history, he brilliantly deploys a multi-part, multi-year strategy to become dictator. Apparently, this strategy starts with Michelle Obama being his designated successor, with any Democratic opponent being destroyed by the media, which is apparently in on the plot, which he says is already in place. Then it gets good. Quoting Card, I'm quoting him now. Obama will claim we need a national police force in order to fight terrorism and crime. The Boston bombing is a useful start, especially when combined with random shootings by crazy people. Because we all know, of course, that the thousands of people who are killed in this country every year, it's all just random shootings by crazy people. But uh, getting back to Card, where will he get his national police? The National Police will be recruited from, quote, young, out-of-work urban men, unquote, and will be hailed as a cure for the economic malaise of the inner cities. In other words, Obama will put a thin veneer of training and military structure on urban gangs and send them out to channel their violence against Obama's enemies. Instead of doing drive-by shootings in their own neighborhoods, these young thugs will do beatings and murders of people trying to escape, people who all seem to be leaders and members of groups that oppose Obama. So in other words, according to Card, armies of young black thugs are going to swarm through the streets of the nation, beating and killing in the name of the Great One, which is Barack Obama, or maybe Michelle, his chosen successor, which of course makes this whole thing not only paranoid and racist, but also sexist, since it depends on Michelle Obama being a puppet and having no mind of her own. Scattered through all this are other assertions that, among other things, Bush never abused the Patriot Act, Bush never lied about WMDs in Iraq, that the Wisconsin teachers who opposed Governor Scott Walker overuse moves to destroy public unions spewed venom and hatred because they want to brainwash America's children, 
and that Obamacare is actually part of this plot because its pr ultimate purpose is to deny medical care to Obama's opponents. Now, of course, at the end of this, he takes the coward's way out. He insists he doesn't really mean this. This is just an experiment in fictional thinking, right before adding, but it sure sounds plausible, doesn't it? Because he says it fits all the facts. In other words, he wants to have it both ways, suggesting it's real while denying any responsibility for having actually said so. Because, well, you see, he's not saying Obama has a plan to become a dictator that involves black gangs swarming the streets of the nation. He's like, you know, just asking. So is Orson Scott Card a homophobic, sexist, racist, bigoted wacko showing signs of pre-senile dementia? Hey, I'm just asking. One thing we don't have to ask about, Orson Scott Card is a clown. We'll go from one end to the other. We're going to go from that to our hero award, which is given occasionally to people who just do the right thing on matters either big or small. In 1984, a man named Robert Nelson was convicted of a Kansas City rape that he insisted he didn't commit. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. In August 2009, Nelson filed a motion seeking DNA testing of a sort that had not been available at the time of his trial. Jackson County, Missouri Circuit Judge David Byrne denied the request. Two years later, Nelson again asked the judge to reconsider, but again Byrne rejected the motion because it fell short of what was required under the statute that Nelson cited. In other words, the judge blew him off because his motion did not fit all of the precise legal niceties and technicalities that the priesthood of the law demand in their invocations. Well, after the second motion failed in late October 2011, Sharon Snyder, a 70-year-old great-grandmother who had served as a court employee for 34 years, gave Nelson's sister a copy of a motion filed in a different case in which the judge uh, approved a DNA request. Now, this is important to note right here. This was a public document. This is one that Nelson's sister could have easily found if she knew its significance and knew where to look for it. In other words, if she knew all the legal technicalities involved. Well, using that motion as a guide, in February 2012, Nelson again filed a motion seeking DNA testing. In August, Byrne upheld the motion, found Nelson to be indigent, and assigned a lawyer to represent him. The Kansas City Police Department's crime lab tested the DNA, and the results were that, the, that the, uh, the results of this motion, the results of the test, excluded Nelson as the source of evidence found at the original rape scene. In other words, Nelson could not have been the assailant. He was freed on June 12th. Five days later, Sharon Snyder was suspended without pay and banned from the courthouse where she had worked for 34 years. Ten days after that, Judge Byrne fired her, just nine months short of her retirement. The reason for her firing? She had helped Nelson by telling him through his sister how he could obtain the DNA testing he had twice failed to get. This supposedly was violating court rules. An innocent man had been sent to prison for 50 years. An innocent man would have, in Byrne's judgment, not only would have, but should have spent additional decades in jail for a crime he did not commit because the legal technicalities and arcane rules of procedure were more important than justice or truth. Instead, because of Sharon Snyder, this man is free, for which he was suspended and then fired what she calls severe punishment. But here's the thing, here's the thing. When she was asked if she would do it again, Sharon Snyder said, oh yes, I would do it again. I'm so happy he got exonerated and he felt that would happen or he wouldn't have filed that motion to start out with. I would do it again. Those are the words of a hero. Okay. I got a couple of updates, uh, several, in fact, four, I think, but we're going to do a couple of them right now. Uh, the first one is that last week uh, I talked about the smackdown of New York City's racist stop and frisk program, which was found by a federal judge to be unconstitutional racial profiling. 
Well, it's worth mentioning here that New York City Police Commissar Ray Kelly is on the short list to replace Janet Napolitano as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. In fact, he's the only potential nominee that Obama has mentioned publicly, saying last month that Kelly is, quote, obviously very well qualified for the job. What's more, he has the backing of Senator uh, Chuck Schumer, a powerful New York Democrat. Now, the thing is, in addition to maintaining, in effect, that uh, stop and frisk is the only thing protecting innocent New Yorkers from the black and brown hordes, Kelly also oversaw attempts to limit or block protests at the 2004 Republican National Convention, efforts which involved illegal mass arrests. He directed the crackdown on Occupy Wall Street, which including arrest, uh, included arresting members of the media trying to cover the event. And, and in cooperation with the CIA, which can't legally act, act domestically, he ran a program to spy on Muslims and on Muslims and mosques, including ones far removed from New York City, far outside of his legal authority. And also, he helped advance the proliferation of surveillance cameras that now blanket New York City streets. That is who Barack Obama thinks is very well qualified to head, to, to head the Department for the Security of the Fatherland. You know, maybe Orson Scott Card is not quite as paranoid as we thought. He's still a bigoted clown, but maybe he's not as paranoid. All right. Update number two. Uh, two weeks ago, I told you about the, uh, uh, the people who sing at noon at the state capitol in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they do this in protest of the anti-worker, anti-people policies of Governor Scott Walk All Over You. I also told you about how police had begun arresting people on the grounds of unlawful assembly. And I added that what made this seem even more outrageous is the fact that police have been threatening bystanders, people just observing, sometimes not even from the same floor of the building where the singing was going on, threatening them with arrest. According to police, it was not only illegal to sing, it was illegal to watch people singing. And in fact, several people were arrested on that basis, and among those threatened with arrest was a member of the Wisconsin State Legislature. Well, the reaction to that part about the bystanders proved to be too embarrassing even for the minions of Walk All Over You. And the Department of Administration of the state has now released a statement that observers of what's called the Solidarity Sing-Along will no longer be arrested or threatened with arrest. And by the way, I should mention that this recent crackdown in the protest has only caused the numbers to grow. The, uh, the attendance is you know, nothing like the 100,000 that filled the streets of, of Madison a couple of years ago, but it is growing. And bear in mind that this protest has been going on every day that the legislature has been in session for over two years now. We're going to take a break. And we're back. And actually, we're back with a couple of more updates. Uh, the first one, just, this is just a quick one, a very quick update on this. Two weeks ago, I talked to you about the disgrace of civil asset forfeiture. Uh, this is where basically where cops can take your stuff based on nothing more than their unsubstantiated suspicion it had something to do with drugs and with all the burden and expense and all the burden of proof on you to try to get your stuff back. Well, on August 19th, PBS NewsHour did a story on civil asset forfeiture, which acknowledged not only the frequent injustice of it, but also how it can be, to quote the piece, an enormous moneymaker for police departments and prosecutors. Uh, as I said before, you know, at the time, I knew about this years ago, but um, now it seems to at least be getting a little attention for some reason, and maybe that's a spark that can grow and we can do something about this. All right. Uh, last of my updates for this week, um, I haven't talked about the Keystone XL pipeline, the one intended to carry these polluting tar sands from Alberta to Texas. The last time I talked about this was back in April. At that time, I mentioned that the State Department, which was involved because the project crosses an international border, had green-lighted the project, saying the environmental impact would be minor. 
but it developed that the report's authors were not actually State Department staff, but outside contractors with ties to the oil industry, and that the one that produced the bulk of the report, a company called Environmental Resources Management, actually has ties to tar sands extraction companies. Now that is a big no-no, serious enough for a, uh, an inquiry by the department's internal watchdog to have been started. All right, that certainly should have been considered a strike against the State Department report. Strike two was when the EPA then said the report had insufficient information and failed to account for potentially vast greenhouse gas emissions and the risk to aquifers along the pipeline's proposed route. Now comes strike three, you're out. Last week, the Department of the Interior posted on its website a letter from its Office of Environmental Protection and Compliance, which called the report's assessment of the effect on wildlife inaccurate. It warned instead of long-term adversarial effects and slammed the State Department report in the, you know, that very polite, delicate, bureaucratic language, of course, but basically slammed the report for failing to consider any effect on wildlife of possible leaks. Now, with even Barack Obama now casting doubt on the, you hear this every time, chant of jobs, 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 uh, he said just recently there was actually no evidence that that's true. Well, there actually is some reason for optimism uh, to hope that this monstrosity can still be stopped. All right, moving on from there. I got to tell you that, that um, uh, a number of years ago, I first did a political newsletter. This is back in the early 1970s. I had an occasional feature I called unintentional humor. This is where something in the news that was not intended to be funny by the person who said or did it or whatever still struck me as, as funny. Well, I find it hard these days to be quite as lighthearted about things as I was at the time. So that unintentional humor has evolved into quoting Pierre de, uh, Pierre de Beaumarchais of uh, saying, I hasten to laugh at everything for fear of being obliged to weep. So let's have a laugh. Okay, the first thing to realize here is that when the Supreme Court uh, cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act, it didn't completely disembowel it. Two important provisions remain. Section 2 allows the federal government to require changes in state and local voting laws that have the effect of disenfranchising groups of voters like minorities. Section 3 empowers courts to require pre-clearance of changes in election laws in the face of evidence that the jurisdiction in question has recently engaged in intentional discrimination. Now, the power of Section 3, of course, is that it can prevent discriminatory changes before they happen. The weakness is that you have to prove intent, which is obviously difficult. The power of Section 2 is that it only requires showing an effect to discriminate, uh, but the weakness here is that Section 2 can only be invoked after these discriminatory laws are in place so that a discriminatory effect can be shown. All right. After SCOTUS gutted the act, several states, um, including, as I mentioned last week, North Carolina, and for another one, Texas, went to warp speed in trying to impose new voter restrictions. Texas, for example, leaped at the chance to reinstitute the redistricting plan that a federal court had already found to be unconstitutional and to push for a new voter suppression bill. Well, the Department of Justice has sued over the redistricting plan, seeking to place Texas back under pre-clearance for 10 years under Section 3, citing its recent history, including that redistricting plan. Now Texas is presenting its defense. Uh, Texas. First, says State Attorney General Greg Abbott, the redistricting is not about race. Oh no, it's about keeping Democrats from holding elective office even white Democrats. I'm quoting the brief. In 2011, both houses of the Texas legislature were controlled by large Republican majorities and the redistricting decisions were designed to increase the pub Republican Party's electoral prospects at the, effect, uh, at the expense rather, of the Democrats. The intent to say was partisan, not racial. And if the effect is to dilute or undermine the voting power of black and brown people or of the poor, well, well, that's just a happy coincidence, and you can't prove otherwise, so can't touch us, nyan, nyan. 
The state's argument, in other words, is that there actually is no discrimination against minorities or the poor in this, and if there is, it's only because they're so stupid and dependent and lazy that they vote for Democrats instead of their true masters. Now, if that wasn't unintentionally hilarious enough, the state's other argument is that even if there is discrimination, which of course there isn't, but even if there is, it's not as bad as, quoting, the pervasive, flagrant, widespread, and rampant discrimination that originally justified preclearance in 1965. It's not just as bad now as it was then, so what's the problem? Now, I'm old enough to remember some of this, I suspect some of you are too. So let me say that I don't recall back in 1965, Texas openly avowing the pervasive, flagrant, widespread, rampant discrimination it was practicing. In fact, if anything, state officials were vociferously denying any discrimination the same as they do now. Remember, you have to keep laughing. Fortunately, um, various voting law experts are doubting this actual work. One said, quoting, the mere desire to achieve partisan advantage does not give Texas a free hand to engage in racial discrimination. If the only way you can protect white incumbents is by diluting the voting strength of Hispanic citizens, you are engaging in intentional racial discrimination. In fact, there was a 2004 case in Massachusetts filed under Section 2 where the defending incumbents defense failed. Now, there unfortunately is an unhappy footnote to all of this hilarity. Uh, this case, of course, could get appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, in 1981, a lawyer in President Ronald Reagan's Justice Department wrote a memo to his boss, Attorney General William French Smith. In that memo, this lawyer strongly opposed a proposed amendment to the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, which Congress was then considering, that would make it clear that Section 2 applied to effect of discrimination, even if you couldn't show actual intent. Now, Congress adopted that amendment, but what's important here is the author of that memo was John Roberts. Yes, that John Roberts. The storm clouds over our right to vote continued to gather and to darken. This bears watching. All right, last, but by no means least this week, it's the outrage of the week. The outrage is simple, straightforward, and obvious. Bradley Manning, as I expect you know, was the whistleblower who leaked a very large number of documents to WikiLeaks, resulting ultimately in his arrest, his trial, and now, today, Wednesday, his sentencing. Bradley Manning has been sentenced to 35 years in prison uh, for the crime of enabling the American public to know about what its own government was doing and about the crimes, the war crimes, it was committing in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was also reduced in rank, dishonorably discharged, and stripped of pay and benefits. This is a moral and ethical outrage. The sentence, was the sentence was condemned by human rights groups. Amnesty International called on Obama to commute his sentence to time served, which would allow for his immediate release. The Center for Constitutional Rights called for an outright pardon. And the American Civil Liberties Union caused, called the sentencing a sad day for all Americans who depend on brave whistleblowers and a free press for a fully informed public debate. Now, there are a number of things notable here about this. Primary among which is the fact that Bradley Manning is being sent to prison for 35 years for telling the American people about crimes committed in their names, while the people who committed those crimes, who organized them, oversaw them, even came up with twisted supposedly legal reasoning to justify them, who are responsible for the murder, the torture, the, the illegal detention, the abuse, the war crimes, those people walk free because our esteemed president said we have to look forward forward, not backward. Words which, as it shouldn't be necessary to mention, but it will anyway, words which were not applied to Bradley Manning. After his arrest, Manning was held in solitary confinement for several months, which is regarded as torture under international treaty, by the way, but hey, who's going to stop us? He was held in solitary confinement in a blatant attempt to break him and force him to testify against the person the Obama gang really wanted to get, Julian Assange, the director of WikiLeaks. And across that time, 
across all this time, during his confinement in solitary, during his trial, all across it, all across three years of this, we have heard government officials accuse Bradley Manning of murder. Members of Congress, members of the administration, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff claim that the leaks endangered U.S. interests and lives. We were told more than once Bradley Manning has blood on his hands. But when it came to the sentencing portion of his trial, when the actual question of harm had to be addressed, when actual harm was supposed to be demonstrated and not just claimed in congressional or prosecutorial rants, when actual harm had to be demonstrated, the government was utterly unable to do so. The government could not, did not produce any evidence that anyone died as the result of these leaks. It couldn't produce any evidence that anything that could rationally fit under the heading of national security was harmed by any of these leaks. It couldn't even produce evidence that international relations were harmed by these leaks. The closest they ever came was when one government witness said that some allies, offended by what the documents revealed about U.S. attitudes toward those allies, some of those allies got chesty. Some allies got chesty. That's the harm. That's the harm that's supposed to justify 35 years in prison. But that actually, almost unintentionally, raises an issue that no one seems to be mentioning. What we ultimately come down here is the fact that according to our own government, lying to our political allies is not a crime. Telling people about those lies is a crime. Torture is not a crime. Telling people about the torture is a crime. War crimes are not crimes. Telling people about war crimes is a crime. According to our government, by doing that, Bradley Manning committed crimes worthy of 35 years in prison. But the fact is, if there had been no lying, if there had been no torture, if there had been no war crimes, there would have been nothing for Bradley Manning to leak. The reason that there's even a case here of any kind is because our government lied, tortured, and committed war crimes. Which is the real point here. This trial, this sentence, this sentence, by the way, is 17 times longer than any previous sentence ever imposed in this country for leaking classified information to the media. Oh, and by the way, a long forgotten part of this is that initially Manning tried to bring this to the Washington Post and the New York Times and it was only after the Times ignored him and the Post wouldn't take him seriously that he went to WikiLinks. But this trial, this sentence is not really about Bradley Manning. It's about future Bradley Mannings. It's a warning to anyone in the government, in or out of the military, who may have any moral qualms about what they learn, who may be upset or even outraged by what they find, to just shut up, keep quiet, don't let anyone know, let the crimes continue, because if you raise your voice, we will come and destroy you. Bradley Manning, sentenced today to 35 years in prison, is a patriot and he is a hero. And don't you ever forget it. Finish up end up with our weekly reminder. I've got just enough time for this. As of August 20th, at least 7,397 people have been killed in this country by guns since Newtown. At least 75 of them in Massachusetts. Have the best week you can. We will see you next week.